This is best friend of the show, Monica Cabina, artist and colorist on Batman The Adventures Continue. And you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming at DCAUReview.com and on your favorite podcast app. Hey, everybody. This is, of course, the DCAU Review, second Justice League Infinity-themed bonus episode. And I am Liam, and with me, as he always is, is Cal. Cal, it's another month, which means it's time to talk about the second issue of our Justice League, Justice League Unlimited sequel comic. That is right, Liam. We are covering issue number two. Hard to believe it's been a month. And if you haven't checked out our initial review, you can check out that in the archives at dcaureview.com or on the Pod Tower on YouTube uh, or on your favorite podcast app, of course. But uh, yeah, Liam, we are covering Justice League Infinity issue number two. Uh, this will be the Cracked Mirror part two. And uh, man, we got some some interesting stuff to discuss here as we follow up. Uh, last month's issue left us with uh, what we what appeared to be Overman from the comics. Uh, replacing Superman or swapping places with our, our Superman from the DCAU. And uh, we kind of follow up on that storyline this month. So uh, not only with Overman's replacement in, uh, in our standard universe, but then also Superman being transported to another universe. And then uh, we get some good, uh, some good follow up to what started last month and sort of resolving what's going on with Martian Manhunter, AKA John Jones. So lots of stuff to tackle today. Lots of good stuff. Some, uh, some stuff that uh, may or may not have some political relevance and certainly mirrored some, some things happening in real life, but uh, I, I feel like was dealt with pretty tactfully, but lots of stuff mm-hmm. to talk about today. So I'm, I'm excited as we jump into this. And of course, uh, you know, this is written by by James Tucker and uh, J.M. DeMatteis, uh, both uh, veteran writers from Justice League Unlimited. And Mr. Tucker did pretty much everything on every DCAU series, pretty much uh, <laughs> back to Superman, the animated series. Uh, and then, when, of course, this issue also featured uh, pen, uh, pencils by or his credit is the artist. So I assume pencils and inks uh, by Mr. Ethan Beavers. And then uh, Nick Filardi is the the colorist. Uh, with Tom Napolitano as the letter letterer for this uh, this issue as well. That is right, and uh, it's it's an interesting issue. Obviously, as you mentioned, we had that incredibly dramatic cliffhanger of Overman appearing in in the place of Superman, right as he was in the middle of a romantic rendezvous with Lois Lane, and we don't, but we don't actually immediately pick up there, and we're we're going to kind of tackle each story that this comic. Uh, the, this comic tells us uh, a little bit individually. So we'll, we'll kind of start with, we, we get this sort of prologue of, of a mezzo uh, bouncing around. And we'll certainly talk a little bit more about this when we get to the art section, but we sort of see him continuing his quest to try to find his purpose. He's in this strange mirrored room. He's seeing visions of his past as, as well as sort of a few shots of, of various, uh, what appear to be glimpses of other worlds, other multiverses, and uh, he hears a disembodied voice calling out to him, sort of taunting him, daring him to break through this mirrored room and uh, and come find them. But before we can sort of find out what's going on with there, we are immediately cut to sort of the no pun intended, the mirror, uh, the mirror image or the mirror story of where we saw Overman, uh, where he was very angry and confused at the end of the, the first issue, we see Superman arriving in his place on this, uh, an earth that is very, very different from, uh, from the main DCAU earth. Oh yes, very much so. Although he does say that it, it, there are some incidents uh, that have happened on his earth that remind him somewhat of what is happening there, but uh, he quickly realizes that this is in fact, not, not simply another place in the DC uh, DC animated universe. No, uh, this is a completely different world as he's actually swapped places with Overman who was uh, standing at what appears to be some sort of rally perhaps. Um, and uh, with a lot mm. of angry people with angry signs and uh, hailing Overman as their savior and uh, sort of supporting him. And there's actually uh, alongside this group of people supporting Overman as he stands on this stage with a, 
a giant uh, a giant tarp with the Overman logo behind him. There's another group uh, group of people next to it uh, with signs uh, talking about peace and love and uh, and stop hating and uh, so there's sort of a counter protesting movement that's happening at the same time and. Uh, Superman does his best. It, it, initially, uh, he believes that he's still in his own universe. So uh, he's kind of curious as to where, in, in, in fact, that he might be that uh, these people are, there's actually Nazi signs in the crowd. Uh, there's uh, some, some Nazi symbolism uh, throughout this, uh, this issue, but there's actual signs with the uh, swastika on it uh, featured in the, in the crowd. And uh, so he, he gets very angry very quickly as he sees that uh, this logo has been erected and uh, that they are calling for him to sort of uh, to sort of uh, continue to lead in tyranny. And uh, he he's he's just kind of like surprised by the uh, the bigotry he talks about and the the corruption of of his his symbol that, that he wears on his chest uh, being used to support this type of hate and and uh, he gets very angry very quickly and is about to almost, uh, it looks like, eviscerate. He stands there with his fists clenched and his teeth gritted and uh, screaming, what's wrong with you people? And he, then he kind of has this, this little bit of awakening where he realizes, uh, he thinks back to this moment that Pa Kent told him. And I, I thought it was written classic, absolutely classic Superman in this, in this little scene here, bringing in Pa Kent, uh, something that Pa Kent reminded him of. And uh, kind of brings him back down to earth a little bit with these people that even though they're spewing this hate and their their points of view are very skewed, he he stops to look at them as human beings. Yeah, this scene, um, this is everything you want from Superman, I think. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, he had it makes it very clear. <laughs> There is no doubt how he feels about this, this racism, this bigotry, especially done in some ways with, you know, as you said, sort of distorting his own emblem his, to be used for that sort of thing. It disgusts him. It, it shocks him. It saddens him and it angers him. And he, as you said, he sort of wants to lash out. He thinks back to the speech and he, you know, he talks about it. these, these were at some point in their lives, these were ordinary people who were, you know, who had their, their perceptions of reality sort of warped by, by constant, uh, you know, constant lies and propaganda. And he, he, you know, he remembers that lesson that he learned that it isn't about meeting hatred with more hatred. It's about meeting it with, with compassion and by, by trying to be an example of the best of us. And, you know, instead of, of reaching out in anger or in some sort of physical way, he, he tries to speak to the crowd and and tells them that you know whatever whatever the struggles that led him to this point that that it's there's no one who hasn't suffered but that the remedy to to fix the suffering is not to you know pick a, a group of people whether it be a, or, or 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 what have you uh, to sort of lash out at to try to make yourself feel more superior that that is not the way to uh, to to fix these issues that you that you may have that you may have had in your own life and. And it, it's not quite clear if 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 anyone is sort of uh is sort of listening to him as he's he's very quickly accosted by a series of purple and green drones, which uh, before you know it, uh, change and form into a a familiar Superman foe, although a definitely a new look for a a very a very aligned with these with these these fascists and Nazis. Uh, Brainiac appears. To confront Superman and to try to stop him from from spreading his uh, his message any further. Yep, and uh, from that point, Superman decides to battle directly with the robot. Uh, you know, there's when we f next catch up with this scene, he's kind of getting his his tail handed to him a little bit, uh, going up against him, and that's where we learn that uh, not only has is overman in charge but overman is actually subservient to another familiar justice league foe that being one vandal savage we actually get a reference uh in the comic one of the comic panels to it's although it's incorrectly named the Sav savage times uh they are they do reference directly uh the savage time uh which of course is uh you can hear our our review of that in the archives at dcaureview.com or on your favorite podcast app but and, and certainly one of the, the 
the most memorable Justice League episodes and dealt with a lot of the similar themes of Nazism and, and fascism certainly taking over. So I guess in this reality that that Vandal Savage was able to to be successful in his in his attempt in, in uh, taking over in, at the end of World War Two. So uh, we we get Superman defeating the Brainiac robot and then flying throughout uh, what appears to be perhaps Metropolis or New York City. And there is uh, more Nazi symbolism on a page in a comic book, maybe since World War II at this point, because there's so <laughs> much of it on the page. Swastikas everywhere. We get a lot of uh, a lot of propaganda signs, uh, certainly done in a in a familiar font uh, to maybe some and, and colors that that you might recognize uh, politically here in in the real world. Maybe done on purpose. Maybe not. Not sure. Maybe a wink and a nod, but probably not knowing knowing the, uh, knowing the writers and their purpose for for writing this but as superman is going up against some of the uh the reich's uh reich's forces there there's a portal that opens up uh and uh, he superman is sucked into it and there he mates up with a couple of interesting names that we we recognize but maybe not the faces that's right. He, he meets up not only with a, a group name we may we may recognize, that being the Freedom Force, sort of a classic uh, World War II era uh, DC superhero team with uh, characters like Uncle Phantom Lady and the Ray and and people like that have, have served in years. But this version is is quite a bit different. Not only do we have a, a gentleman by the name of Abraham, Z- though people call him Zod. We also feature uh, someone referred to as Doomsday, but who also seems to t- we have someone uh, referred to as Doomsday that also seems to have a uh, sort of muddy clay face fish complexion to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, maybe a little bit of a mashup there. And then I could be wrong about this, Cal. Um, and I haven't really checked to see if this has been floated elsewhere. But does this, uh, this young lady who is referred to as Metallo did she did she remind you of maybe a character we met in a certain in a certain uh, heavy metal episode of Superman? Absolutely. That is without a doubt. I would be I would put lots of money on that, that that's Natasha Irons right there. Um, I, I think the character model looks very similar. Um, it would make sense because that episode also featured Metallo. So having her, mm-hmm. her maybe be the, this this universe's Metallo would would make sense. Uh, we don't we don't get much of an explanation after that because that's that's sort of the last that we see of this Superman for this issue. So I'm sure we'll be able to uh, to learn more about them in uh, in the next issue as we as we learn about these freedom fighters from this uh, from this from this universe here, the General Zod or Abraham Zodesta. <laughs> uh, but this would be technically, I guess, the first introduction of General Zod to the DCAU, would it not? Yeah, so yeah, so Zod has appeared in a couple of comic book uh, DCAU tie-in books that I think would at least one would be sort of decidedly not uh, not in not in canon. It, there's a there's an issue of of Superman Adventures actually called Supergirl Adventures. It was it was renamed for that issue where they sort of established the idea that Zod was actually a an Argo, uh, not the sister planet of Krypton. Uh, uh, that he was a general on on Supergirl's planet, and and that he actually comes to Earth with uh, with uh, with uh, and and attacks her. Actually, doesn't interact with Superman. Um, that issue involves, I think, her reactions to Kryptonite, uh, which I guess hadn't necessarily been established of whether or not Kryptonite would affect her in the show yet. So uh, that that uh, that one I think falls out of canon. We also uh, that character actually sporting a very similar look also showed up in a. Uh, later issue of the Justice League Unlimited tie-in comic, but this is a uh, as far as like what could be considered like fully uh, fully a fully canon a fully canonized version of uh, General Zod uh, that remains to be seen. This this could be the one though. There you go. So we'll we'll learn more about that hopefully in in next uh, his identity and while they are named the Freedom Fighters, it seems like that they would be 
on the the right side of things here so we'll see it's another another twist on this universe is general zod obviously tends to be a, a foil of superman so interesting if they make him the the ally for this this universe so that sort of wraps this story up as we mentioned there's three of them uh so i guess we can uh we can sort of move over perhaps lamb to the other superman or as he's referred to as we said in this issue overman that's right. So that, yeah, that sequence sort of picks up right where we left off as, uh, as he's confronting Lois Lane, trying to figure out why, why he's been transported to this strange place he doesn't recognize. We actually, uh, dollar in the jar, uh, Cal, we have a reference to uh, Brave New Metropolis, as I believe you pointed out in our, our last month's uh, J- Justice League Infinity. The S on Overman's chest is the same S that Lois saw on a different uh, fascist Superman's chest in, in that episode. And Lois actually mentions that here, but that uh, it's, it becomes clear very quickly that this is not Superman that, uh, that she met in, in that world. This version of Superman will not be, uh, will not be swayed by a heart to heart with Lois the way that uh, the way that that one was. Yeah, and I appreciate it. I think that the the writers did a good job of clearing that up because I think, uh, you know, I not that not that Paul Dini and 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 Alan Burnett in Batman: The Adventures Continue have completely disregarded fans and 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 continuity. Um, I well, I guess some people may may argue that they have, but I think that their their care about things tend to be uh, as far as continuity is concerned. Uh, and certainly maybe past past fans maybe is a little bit less it would seem than than maybe what uh, Mr. DeMatteis and Mr. Tucker have done for for this thus far although it's only two issues but the fact that they specifically when they refer to uh, past episodes they they make sure that they overtly point that out with a little word bubble and and then in this one, making sure to differentiate that this is not that same Superman, despite having the same Superman logo, that this is not that same Superman. This is Overman. Um, I appreciate that. I think that's that's going above and beyond to care for your readers, to not leave them out there trying mm-hmm. to come up with, with theories as to what <laughs> happened to make the Brave New Metropolis Superman go back to being you know crazy and controlling. So uh, but it, we actually later on in the issue, we actually get the the backstory for Ober, Overman. But as he comes comes to and and uh, Superman actually narrates the the entire issue here. So for the first issue, we had Martian Manhunter narrating. This issue, we have Superman narrating the the entirety of it. And then uh, so so we actually have Superman talking about how terrified Lois was, and but uh, how she was. Also, while she was terrified, uh, she was still still acting in her own character, and she pulls out a uh, a weapon, a, a kryptonite uh, infused gun that she is uh, she points at Overman and shoots him with. Clark, as he's narrating this, mentions that uh, she could have killed him with it, but because she's low, she simply hits him with a with a ray strong enough to to put him in a a coma like state for a few weeks. Uh, but unfortunately. Uh, it appears that kryptonite has no effect on Overman. Wouldn't you know it? So he is uh, he is very upset about it. And uh, there's a couple great panels that we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a moment. But uh, he looks like he's going to eviscerate Lois with his heat vision and uh, sort of mirroring what we talked about with Superman uh, on the other side, the actual Superman, where he looks like he's mad enough to perhaps eviscerate these Nazis, uh, Overman decides at the last second to fly away. So uh, maybe he's uh, maybe there is still some good in him, uh, and uh, we kind of learn that as we we continue to see him fighting off the Justice League. He's out uh, fighting fighting them, and kind of sees this as an opportunity to sort of con- a new world to conquer. Uh, which of course that's that's what every bad guy does right and uh he he has a pretty pretty great battle with the justice leaguers that are left there on earth yeah that's right we get to and we'll we can talk more about this in our but we we do see a team of green lantern john stewart of course we see batman elongated man vixen uh, as well as wonder woman there's also one character that appears to be knocked out i'm not exactly sure who that's uh, supposed to be because they're sort of in shadow I don't know if we get a good look at that character in the uh, in the rest of the issue, but uh, 
but yeah, they, they have the fight and they're sort of overmatched and, and, he, and certainly, you know, the, the leaguers have a little less power there. The, the Hawk girls and, and Batman and are, and Vixens are sort of dispatched pretty quickly. Wonder Woman does have a, a really great moment there as, as mentioned, this is a, this is a very fascist, a very Nazi Superman. And he's, he's, He's insulted that a woman would uh, would dare would dare uh, would dare defy him and and try to stop him and and she and she and Superman sort of or Overman sort of seem to fight to a standstill uh, when in fact we get the the reappearance and that is sort of our our C story for this issue is the official reemergence of the Martian Manhunter who is able to uh, disable him uh, using his telepathy and as he does we do see a a sort of uh, quick, quick uh, collage of shots of, of of Overman's origins from Finn Kal-El escaping Krypton, as as the story as we know, but then at some point being raised by by Vandal Savage in this this uh, this Savage Time uh, universe, and uh, even falling in love with his own Lois Lane before uh, ultimately deciding to kill her when he finds out that she is feeding information to those uh, those freedom fighters, but. But he's uh, he's disabled uh, by by Jean, and that's sort of where we leave Overman for this issue. But yes, speaking of Jean, we uh, we do see uh, as, as was sort of hinted at in the last issue, uh, Jean keeps feeling himself being pulled back towards uh, towards action, trying to live this this quiet life of solitude as he continues. He's he's living as 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 this woman uh, Amrit Jesuwala is, uh, I believe the name the name he is. Uh, that he's given and and there he sort of talked once again talking with uh the friend that uh that he was talking to in the previous issue when uh it turns out that it's not just superman who has uh, has been uh transported away and perhaps replaced with an evil doppelganger as 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 uh, jean's friend also escapes and we see we see a lot of people sort of looking around in a panic trying to find their uh their their loved ones and and that's sort of it's a, it's a very almost sorrow sorrowful moment as as Jean realizes that this uh, this Amrit woman must must die and fade away so that uh, so that the Martian Manhunter can return and uh, it's so it is sort of this uh, it's this bittersweet moment as it's a cool heroic moment and once again we'll certainly talk about that in art but. Then uh, yeah, he he confronts uh, Overman, and, and as we said, uses his telepathy to uh, to sort of not only to discover his origins, but to disable him. And he he sort of immediately expresses regret for even doing that, despite the fact that we've established that Overman is this this sort of fascist monster and is this incredibly dangerous threat. He still feels like once he learns about who this this guy is that that he was he himself like like we heard superman talking about earlier in the issue you know he wasn't an inherently bad person but was was exposed to these these terrible ideas this propaganda from sort of the moment he was born and had never really had a chance to uh, to be anything but this this terrible thing and it's interesting to see that even though he's back in action it's not exactly a happy moment for jean yeah, he sort of reluctantly, we, we saw him struggling with that in the last issue and I think continuing that thread here and really ultimately not jumping into action until his friend, his direct friend was affected by it. So you you see once it starts hitting close to home at that point, uh, he kind of he kind of decides at that point and surrenders to the idea that he has to figure out what's going on. And yeah, I love I love that John has such a great conscience about him. You know, he 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 does this thing and, and invades uh, over man's mind and sort of overpowers in that way and is immediately as you said filled with regret and he's recounting to wonder woman um how he's just a you know over man ultimately is just a broken version of of superman he's just a broken man um and uh is is certainly regrets invading his mind the way that he did and diana tries to reassure him that you know that he had no choice and uh he comes back with a very uh, very honorable uh, way of of expressing back to Diana that hey, there's always a choice, and uh, just as he he's about to sort of 
uh, continue uh, this conversation with Diana and Batman, uh, he senses something is uh, is shifting. And that's kind of where we get the wrap up for the for the issue, which sort of bookends what we saw at the beginning with Amazo as he's still in this room with these mirrors and uh, the mirrors begin to literally shatter and shake and uh, Superman continues to narrate uh, the final part of this issue and uh, says that uh, he he says it's the uh, the end of everything begins uh, with this end of this issue. So uh, they didn't know it at the time, but that's what what happens. So uh, and that leaves us as our uh, as our cliffhanger as we see see Amazo sort of floating in a Kirby crackle with a bunch of these uh, shards <laughs> of of mirror hanging around and. We get the title of the next issue, which I think we may have already known based on some solicits that we've seen, but uh, that being War of the Supermen. So uh, it seems that we are we are certainly uh, destined to see some more versions, perhaps, of, of uh, the last son of Krypton as he is in the um, scene in the multiverse, perhaps in the next issue. So some good stuff coming up here, but that kind of wraps up the, uh, the plot for this week's uh, issue. Yeah, and that's uh, I think overall uh, I I liked this issue a lot. I thought it was uh, a little bit more focused in the way it was laid out. Uh, as as we mentioned, the the stories do kind of overlay. You know, we we see the first few pages of Superman's adventure, then it cuts to Overman, then it cuts to Jean, and then Jean's story sort of interacts with uh, with Overman's there at the end. But uh, just the way it was laid out, I thought it, it was pretty a pretty slick and and clean, easy to follow story. Like I said, I think uh, that the Superman being so compassionate and trying to be a good example, even to these people that are, that are holding, you know, signs with swastikas on them that have so much rage in their heart and how you see how much he wants to give that rage back to them, but ultimately chooses not to. Um, I think that's, that's, again, that's just some perfect grade a Superman stuff. And it's that's what you want Superman. you want an idealist you want you know it's 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 almost i think overused at this point but the the symbol of hope right that's what you sure. want from superman is that no to, that he truly believes that nobody is is too far gone that they can't be saved and again it doesn't it doesn't excuse the bigotry or the or the hate um it doesn't doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, let anyone off the hook or say that there shouldn't be consequences for those actions but at the same time it does it is such a, i think a great superman thing to say hey you can you can still come back from this you don't have to stay on this path and it's it's a it's a really great moment and i think that's definitely i think the standout uh the standout stuff for me in this issue there's a lot of cool obviously it's cool to vi- revisit that sort of timeline or as we find out now it's its own alternate earth uh, of the Savage Time stuff, I think that's fun. And as you mentioned, the callback, uh, you know, the callbacks and, and the fact that uh, I believe it's the editor, uh, Andrew Marino, uh, made note of, of both Brave New Metropolis and and Savage Time uh, to, to make it clear what, what they were referencing. I think I think that's a lot of fun. But yeah, I think I definitely think the Superman stuff was was my favorite for uh, for this month. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think the the elephant in the room that or the donkey in the room whichever political <laughs> whatever political <laughs> that you have or maybe somewhere in between um you know i i think to discuss is that certainly there is a lot of overt imagery in this issue it's overtly speaking out against you know a lot of behavior that uh, is generally, I would say, I would hope to say that the majority of Americans find unacceptable um, and certainly is relevant to conversations that have happened over the last, uh, certainly over the last uh, four years, five years, uh, but, you know, have been around for a, a long time in America. So it's, it's, that's something that is certainly touched on here. I don't feel like it was uh, necessarily bashing people over the head with it too. I think maybe there is uh, the there's going to be a few outliers that feel like ah oh, this is a comic that's preaching to me and it's talking about uh, you know I don't want politics in my comic books and stuff like that and and I you know it, that's your right if you don't if you don't want to read a comic book that you know talk, discusses anything that's happening in real life and you want to use it as escapism there's a lot of material out there for you to to enjoy there's a lot of stuff to read that probably doesn't maybe 
touch or push those buttons. But I feel like, I feel like reading this, if Superman had just smashed those people in the face immediately afterwards, deservedly so people literally waving swastika you know signs with swastikas on them and stuff you there's a large group of people that would say they get what they deserve that's that's right you know he's doing that but the fact that as you said it perfectly displays superman's idealism of hey I'm not going to excuse their behavior. Their behavior itself is wrong. But taking, like the thing that struck me was making this person, these people humans. They, he humanizes them. He says, there must have been something that went terribly wrong with these people's lives to have this much hate and bigotry and spewing out of them. But he he recognizes them as humans. And I feel like in it, you know, going to stand on a soapbox for a second, but our, our culture nowadays, we have the tendency to forget that hu- that the humanness of certain things, if you have a, a terrible po- position on something, then you are, you are subhuman. And, you know, the reality is, is that when Superman talks about, Hey, you know, I can't come back with hate to attack this. You know, it's, it's very much in the vein of the Mar- of the Reverend Martin Luther King, you know, it's, it's that ca- hate can't overcome hate. And for Superman to refer, you know, to reference that as something that was instilled to him by his parents in order to to sort of combat this, not with coming back with anger and hatred, that's just going to continue to ignite the flame, but to kind of overcome that evil with good is just, it's done so well. And I appreciated the way that it was written in that way. And I think you're right. It's just this Superman part here is, is, is just great. The fact that he's disgusted, certainly, absolutely. He should be disgusted that his symbol is being used to sort of promote this propaganda and this point of view. Uh, but then the fact that he's, he does his best to try and, and redeem these people that have gone so far in the wrong direction uh, is just inherently Superman. And I absolutely loved it. Great great job uh you know able to thankfully both uh mr damateus and mr tucker both have have twitter so you know if, if you if you liked this uh you know let them know uh, that you're enjoying this because uh you know there's they're, they're putting their their blood sweat and tears into writing this stuff and i'm sure they enjoy hearing uh it, people that enjoy it so uh, let them let them know that you're enjoying it if you enjoyed it as much as i did Absolutely. And you know, not, not a ton I can add to that. I will, I will just mention, you know, the very, the very origins of, of the Superman character, right. It was, it was, it was created by two Jewish men in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, one of the original sort of catchphrases of this character was champion of the oppressed. Yep. Like this is very much in the DNA of the origins of this character have always been that compassion of looking out of, you know, when he literally stands between the, you know, the counter protesters and this, this, you know, hateful raging mob. And again, but, and then, but taking that and not, not just, uh, you know, not just defending them by, as you said, fighting off the, the, you know, the attackers, but by, by trying to reason with them, by trying to tell them that it's not too late for them and that they could, that they could, this is just, it's just beautiful Superman. It is, it is everything I love. It's why Superman is, is my favorite. And, and it wasn't, I didn't always feel that way um, when I, you know, when I was younger, but as I've, I've gotten a little bit older and I guess have experienced more real life, I have found myself gravitating more towards Superman, particularly a Superman like this, um, because that's, that's what we all want. Um, I, I tweeted it this week and, and we talked about it, but there's a quote, it kind of goes viral on Twitter like five or six times a year, but uh, somebody somebody asked Christopher Reeve, who of course played Superman in the live action movies in the seventies. You know what what is Superman to you? And, and he says he's a friend, and that's what that's what people really need. Mm. And that's Love that that, that means you know that gives me chills every time. Every time I start seeing it retweeted, I watch the full clip because it, it makes it makes me a little bit emotional and it makes me feel good. And and that's that's what I want, you know. And it's it's a way of touching on these very real very mature themes and still giving you a little that hope that idealism that escapism that you want from from superman so just grade a tremendous job by uh, by mr de Mateus and mr tucker in in this issue and uh and all all of these great moments in the in the script and in the, in the plot of course coupled with uh, another uh, just tremendous 
uh, tremendous work, very, very great work from our, our art team, of course, Cal. We have uh, Ethan Beavers, once again, as the artist, as you mentioned, and Nick Filardi as the colorist. Man, not only do we get some, some, uh, some great battle scenes later in the issue, certainly as Overman fights the Justice League and, and Superman fights the Brainiac robot, but uh, hey, right at the start here, we get a lot of nice little, again, if you love that continuity, if you love those Easter eggs, the, uh, the, the panels that we see, the, the shots that we see in the mirror, the shattered mirror that Amazo is looking at, we get a lot of uh, you know, scenes or pulled directly from uh, specific episodes of, uh, of Justice League and JLU. That's right. There's definitely shots that you see there directly from the return. Uh, there's a there's a dark side scene. Not not quite sure what that dark side scene directly uh, may be from. Certainly uh, one of the other Justice League uh, or Justice League Unlimited episodes, maybe even Superman, the animated series. We get uh, we get a shot of the Justice Lords Wonder Woman also there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see Solomon Grundy and uh, from from the episode uh, where. Uh, he and Dr. Fate uh, with, with Dr. Fate that we actually just covered not too long ago and our month of magic. Uh, we get, uh, we get uh, lots, lots on that first initial page there. And then uh, on the next page over is when we get some of those other ones with the justice Lords, uh, perhaps uh, another version of Superman. Uh, not sure. looks like, mm, could be could be one of the Superman we see in next month's issue. I'm not sure quite yet, but this is either I believe this is either uh, I believe his name is I want to say his name is Calvin Calvin Harris. It's it's there's the pre, there's a couple of different uh, uh, African American Superman characters. One is uh, the president in in his world uh, was was you know not not so subtly uh, modeled after uh, the. Uh, the 44th president of the United States. And then there's also another version uh, named Val Zod from the, uh, from the Earth 2 comic book series, which was uh, uh, written by Tom Taylor and, and drawn by Nicholas Scott that, uh, that featured another version, uh, an alternate take on Superman. So not quite sure which one that is. But again, as, you, as you've alluded to, Cal, if you've seen that Dan Mora cover for, uh, I believe it's JLI issue three, uh, you know we're going to see some version of that character coming soon. That's right. So uh, what stood out to me, we, and we get a lot of these throughout this, and I, I think this is something that I feel like um, maybe sets this apart is, you know, it's, we're going to naturally compare it to our other DCAU content that we're, we're getting these days. And that's, that's of course, Batman, the adventures continue, but, uh, it seems that Mr. Beavers or, you know, whoever decides, uh, how the, the layout of the, the issues go really enjoys a good splash page. Uh, and if you're familiar yes. with comics, a good splash page is a full page, uh, cu- taken up by one specific image. And, uh, we get uh, a couple. We get at least three or four of those in this this, and a couple of half half uh, splash pages as well. Um, so you you really get some specific images that really stand out, and I feel like those ones are designed um, really. I guess you could say the first two the first two pages are splash pages, and then we get one with Superman on the podium, sort of looking shocked and you know not knowing where he is as we we introduce the the title of the story. Uh, We get another half splash page later on with Superman and the Brainiac uh, robot Mm -hmm. Uh, one. uh, And later on we get uh, Lois as Overman is flying away. And then we get another uh, giant full splash page of Overman versus the justice league. And then, uh, a, another quite striking uh, pair of half uh, splash pages uh, as we get the origin of Overman. So uh, some very striking and, and certainly expressive splash pages going on here uh, that leave uh, some, some great imagery right there and, and allow you, I feel like what they do is they allow you to understand at least for me, it allows me to sort of soak in the importance of what's happening directly on that page, as as opposed to having multiple panels that sort of your eyes just dart from when it's on a single page like that, it's really got to grab your attention. And there's usually some details tucked away or something that, you know, some things that they really want you to absorb and sort of feel the impact of what's going on in that scene. And I feel like uh, not only those first two pages with Amazo, but then that first shot of Superman standing behind the podium, you know, he's, he's has this expression of terror. And I feel like it comes across 
uh, very much. You can almost hear the, the chanting of the crowd standing there in front of him as they look on angrily. So it's a, it's a, it's a very striking image in that way. And I love the way that, that uh, Mr. Beavers uses those splash pages throughout the issue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I, and uh, you know, again, not a good thing or necessarily good or bad, but uh, yeah, that's something I think in adventures continue uh, Ty Templeton, uh, who's, who's been the artist for the, uh, the, the first series and now for the first couple of issues, the second series generally seems to stay away from that. seems to be like, a, they, the, he seems to really want to make use of the, you know, the panels and, you know, it's usually grids and sort of, if there is sort of a wider splash. It's usually in sort of a smaller square within a, you know, within the, the panel, you don't get a lot of, you know, I can't remember many, if any, uh, uh, page that we've gotten in, in that series. And, and I know depend, probably depending on page count, that's mm -hmm. also probably plays a factor of how much information you're trying to get out and how many pages you have to do it, I'm sure. But yeah, I, I, I do think it, it does allow a lot of these moments to really feel very striking the shot of Amazo on his knees as he's looking at all of these shards the as you mentioned the shot of superman on the podium i think is tremendous and 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 some great color work by nick filardi there is i feel like each each section kind of has its own unique uh identity when it comes to the uh, to to the uh to the color palette with uh you know the, that that opening scene where he's at the podium feels like it's it's very orange and very sort of red and which sort of i guess matches the the temperature of uh of uh the the anger of the crowd as, as superman's kind of confronting them and and then that's sort of a that juxtaposed in this sort of a you know more more of a i guess more of a like a just sort of a, a more normal looking palette when you're back on, on the main earth and then you know, the deep greens as, uh, as, as John is, is still in, in India for the, for the few pages and then just a, a breathtaking shot. It's actually not, a, not really a splash page, but we see the, the panels of, of, of Jean shape changing from this Indian woman back into the garb of the Martian Manhunter. And we see him flying past a, a jet as just this, you know, this beautiful orange sky is kind of behind him with the sun. And then we get just this awesome heroic pose by, uh, by Mr. Beavers, again, with some great colors by Nick as, uh, as we see this sort of official resurgence of the Martian Manhunter. And, and then as you mentioned there, and I think you, you touched on this earlier, Cal, but uh, among all of those other great things, lots and lots of, uh, of Kirby crackle, which you, which, you know, we appreciate on this show. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's, I think it's featured throughout and in, in, if not all of the little threads that we talked about in, in most of them uh, throughout. So always, always appreciate a good Kirby crackle. And yeah, I, th I think, I think the colors this week, I think last week uh, they tended to be uh, sort of, they were very pink and, and reddish and it, that was sort of the dominating color palette of the entire issue. It felt like, um, so that that led I, I know that last week it, to me, you know, one of the things that I share was that it didn't quite feel like we were maybe in the in the world of Justice League. And I think weirdly enough, and it speaks to the the power of, of, of sort of the visuals that you're using. But even though this this art style continues to be more like a Bruce Tim uh, draw, it, it is very much Bruce Tim's style of drawing. It's just his more his comic style of drawing. So Mr. Beavers does a, a, a great job of uh, d using his own style, but certainly feeling very similar, like it belongs in that world of, of Bruce Tim. But I think the color palette this week really grounded me that this is a mm -hmm. this is a DCAU story. Um, everything that you talked about from the, you know, the, the colors, you know, sort of enhancing the Superman aspect uh, as, you know, as he's dealing with the anger and the rage and the hatred, uh, the reds of that. And then the more darker tones that, that, uh, that Mr. Filardi uses in the, you know, the interaction with Superman and, and, uh, and Lois Lane. And then you get some great Kirby crackle coming out of the, the kryptonite ray gun that, that uh, Lois uses. And there's a green, sort of a green haze there, followed up by this series of panels where Overman looks like he's about to obliterate Lois. And the entire panel is actually shaded in red as he as it appears he's about to blow her away before flying away. And then, oh yeah, I think the, the green matching, maybe, maybe not an accident that where Jean is staying is also very green, him being a, you know, a green hero in and of itself. 
uh, plays into that. There's some great shots of him, as you said, that whole page of him doing the transformation, flying past the plane, and then uh, sort of flying at you as he kind of crosses over between two panels, I thought was a great shot. And uh, following that up with the, with the splash page of the Justice League taking on Overman, uh, fan- just fantastic. The, the visuals are great. I think the the pages that really really stand out for me back to back you have those the the story of overman and there's a very expressive sort of you can almost hear a george newburn uh cry coming out of this 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 overman character yeah. as uh you know as as he's going through this anguish as john is it is inside of his head learning his story and then uh, sort of a, a similar set of anguish as, as he learns that the, his Lois is actually a spy. So um, I think it works very well. And then we we wrap up with this this final section of visuals of Amazo being sort of blowing a hole through this this mirrored room where he was, and uh, we're back to these these light blues and sort of juxtaposed to his his neon yellow colors. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, the visuals this week, the the, the artwork, uh, just amazing. Uh, Mr. Beaver's style continues to be true to the DCAU, but certainly his own style and uh, s- several different panels, I think, are are just breathtaking when you look at them and just really great, uh, really great pieces in and of themselves. And then when you put them together, making up this entire issue, just just great. Absolutely. Yeah. Just another, another example that, you know, we've, we've really come to enjoy both with this and with, of course, with, uh, with Batman, the adventures continue just seeing the, uh, the, the way that the, that not only a, a really fun script, but then that those really dramatic visuals, as you mentioned, when, when we're inside over, over man's mind and we see, you know, him, him and Lois sort of happy. And then we get the incredibly haunting, like almost completely silhouetted. We just see the bottom half of her body is, as they uh, make mention that she was uh, well, that there was a noose wrapped around her neck. Uh, they don't, they don't show her hanging necessarily, but they certainly imply that. And, uh, and, you know, and sort of the, the dramatic, uh, you know, Overman on his knees in, in mourning of that. And then, then that final page is, uh, as, as Amazo has seemingly shattered the mirror and is, and is sort of being, uh, sent through with all these waves of energy to kind of do an interesting kind of blurring effect on, on that page as well, which I, th- I thought was pretty cool, but uh, yeah, overall, I think this is another really strong issue. It's very, again, I think they make the most of, of the story they had to tell. And, uh, and you, know, you combine that great story with some really dramatic visuals, you know, the, and, you know, ev- everything feels like it has impact, just the, the little shots there. And, and again, we sort of find out later why, but, you know, he has Overman has this rage in his eyes and we cut to there's just these four panels and it cuts to Lois. And then we cut back to over Overman and his eyes have glowed red and we, we and it's back to Lois and we see her sort of putting her hand up and and the whole room is glowing red. And then as, as she stands up, she realizes that he's left and that he spared her and then we're sort of returned to the natural color of the room. It's just it's re- just some really tremendous stuff all the all the way through the issue and kind of all all three of our, our main stories here. So yeah, this is another, uh, another big thumbs up for me. I thought this was, uh, uh, this was, I, I liked issue one a lot, but I thought maybe it was a little, a little scatterbrained, especially with the, the sort of random parademon invasion in the middle of the, uh, the issue. But, but this one I thought, and I thought both from a, from a script standpoint and from a, a visual, uh, you know, an, an art standpoint, just really everything felt on point. And I thought this was a, this was a great job of taking maybe a pretty solid start and just going, let's, you know, let's take it up a notch. Let's get even better from here. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it got me excited for what's coming next at the end of last month. Like you said, I liked it. I enjoyed it. We're, we're not going to turn down DCAU content, but you know, it just felt like maybe another issue of, you know, Justice League Adventures or Justice League Unlimited that, you know, the the tie-in comics, it didn't really feel like it was unique or like they necessarily were launching into this big event. And uh, this sort of, I, I think, definitely has got me a lot more excited. I'm, I'm excited to see uh, what's coming next month and, and certainly uh, in the issues beyond this. So, we are uh, we we are in store for a uh, a fun rest of the summer and then are into early fall here as we we uh, we track with these these great writers who are doing their best to bring us some excellent DCAU content. 
Absolutely. Well, that will begin to wrap us up for this episode, Cal. Thank you, everyone, for listening, whether you do so on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or, of course, if you are watching slash listening on the Pod Tower YouTube channel, we appreciate you. And, of course, if you, even if you aren't a regular YouTube podcast listener, uh, we would appreciate if you went and subscribed to us on that Pod Tower channel as you're not only helping us out, but also our friends at the Watchtower database, as well as our friends at Tim Talk. Lots of great content uh, from all those people. And uh, you can hear every episode, past and present, that we uh, that we have put out as well on that channel. Um, so definitely thank you for checking us out wherever you do. And uh, Cal, not only do we have our regular episode this week, we have this bonus episode and uh, I guess the the lineup was a little bit staggered this month rather than them both coming out this week. Uh, we will have yet another bonus episode coming up next week uh, with uh, our with our other DCAU tie in comic that is uh, that is currently being released by DC. Yeah, that's right. The powers that be at DC had mercy on us this week and did not make <laughs> us record three separate podcasts or. I'm sorry, this is live. What are we joking? You know, whenever somebody listens, to this, <laughs> it's live. Uh, but uh, we didn't have to worry about covering covering three different separate things. So kudos to the people at DC. We uh, Yeah, but looking forward to covering the next issue of Batman The Adventures Continue. So if you are have not checked our, out our past episodes of that, you can check out that in the archives. Go back and listen to those. We have all of season uh, season one of that of that comic uh, all in the archives, and then uh, we have reviewed both uh, or all three of the or both of the issues thus far. Sorry, yeah, losing track over here of what we're doing uh, of the uh, first two issues of that as well. So looking forward to covering that with you next week. Absolutely, Cal. Looking forward to that. Lots of DCAU comic book goodness to talk about and definitely want to hear from uh, you, the listeners, uh, whether you uh, add us at DCAU Review on Twitter. I'd be happy to talk with you about this issue or the adventures continue or the regular episodes we're reviewing or pretty much anything else related to, uh, to DC Comics properties. Lots of exciting stuff going on in the movie world as well right now. Sure, there's lots to talk about there. And of course, you can also find us on Instagram at DCAU Review as well. Leave us a comment there. Let us know what you thought of uh, not only our review, but of, uh, of the stuff we're reviewing. We look forward to hearing from you. But uh, until our next episode, I'm Liam. And I'm Cal. And we'll be back soon with another episode of the DCAU Review. Bye-bye.